All right. Well, I've got Stuart here, who's the head of content for Mutiny. What's going on, my friend? Hey, Jonathan. Good to be here. I was just singing your praises, obviously, as we were chatting earlier, uh, that I see you literally everywhere between ad conferences, doing interviews all over LinkedIn. Uh, so your organic game is clearly very strong. Have you... Uh, have you been like batting in like on organic for a while or like what's been the is that like a strategy you just like to start getting into because I see your content literally like every week. That's good to hear. That means it's working. Yeah. Um but no, I've I've been posting on LinkedIn for like I'd say 4 years yeah. and it was really my foot in the door into marketing and into content. Uh-huh. So I went to school and studied forestry as my undergrad. That's crazy. And so I had no background in marketing or in business or anything like that um one day i was like i think i want to move into like business i don't know what that means i think marketing is kind of cool um so i started like reading seth godin's books and then like posting on linkedin about like what i thought about it um and then that kind of evolved into a podcast where i'd like reach out to people who had cool jobs and just like ask them about marketing and Really, these were ba- there's these are super basic conversations. Right. I had no idea about the industry. I had no idea about the roles and responsibilities and whatnot. Right. And so I just kind of absorbed um, through people that way, and then would be sharing it on LinkedIn. Yeah. And eventually, that as I was interviewing people on my podcast, they started g- asking me if they wanted to work for them and giving me jobs. Yep. So I was like, "What do you want me to do?" And they're like, "Do exactly what you're doing right now." I'm like, "Why?" And they're like, "That's content marketing." Uh-huh. I'm like, "Okay, cool. I didn't." I actually didn't know that was a job. I love that. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a number of years, and um, I mean, it's been you know slow growth. I've never really gone for the like rocket ship growth hack stuff. I've mm-hmm. been tried tried to just be consistent, and um, I think looking back, I'm you know maybe throttled my growth a little bit in terms of like viewership, but I'm really happy with the response it gets and the like quality of the people who engage with my stuff. I think that's really the thing. Um, if anyone's thinking about getting on the organic game mm-hmm. or posting on LinkedIn and stuff like that is like, honestly, it's don't worry about any of your numbers. Just worry exactly. about like, did you have one conversation or like interesting person that you respect comment or like DM you? And if so, you know, you're totally on the right track. So don't be discouraged by the numbers. Make sure it's human totally. and like make these kind of conversations happen. I love the the jump from forestry to to marketer. It's always so interesting too, because I feel like I mean, most people, especially when you're taking marketing courses in school or university, I mean, they weren't talking about some of the things that we do day in, day out in B2B marketing. It's nothing really like that. I certainly didn't learn any of that. Um, and so you just kind of fall into it from wherever. I was a sports management major and I was wanting to yeah. work for the Redskins when they were called the Redskins at the time. And I realized it was a bad idea because their back office is super tiny, really small. And I was also graduating around 2008, 2009. So there just wasn't a lot of, you know, opportunity out there. But, uh, but anyway, well, let's jump into it. I want to want to make sure we get into a couple things because I have a little bit of agenda here and some scratch notes on a piece of paper here I'm looking at. But before we get into that all, like, I guess just real quick about like your role, what you do in Mutiny and like, what is Mutiny just at a high level so people get some context because we're going to be breaking a few things down that you guys have been working on, which I really love the brand and all the content you guys are putting out there. But what's like the high level kind of brief on Mutiny and you and what you guys are up to? Absolutely. Yeah, Mutiny is a web personalization and A-B testing platform. Uh, so it allows, you know, anyone within your marketing team to be able to adjust your website and any web properties you have. Mm. Um based on, you know, what you want your audience to see. Um, this, this gives you like the actual ability to drive conversions, whether it's like, you know, light touch conversions, like join our newsletter, or it's like book a demo. Mm -hmm. Um, like that's your really as like a, as a web or marketing team, like that's really your only like one place where you can have a meaningful impact on pipeline is like, did we turn website visitors into meaningful opportunities Mm -hmm. and so having you know this ability to personalize create like outbound pages to test what's working what's not to segment your audience so they see things that they're supposed to see in use you know the way you want them to see it that's how we're enabling marketing teams to really take control and um over their website and drive pipeline that way so that's a little bit about mutiny uh i lead content there Mm -hmm. uh and so it's interesting getting having to market to marketers is you know everything is, you know, I, I can't BS anything <laughs> because everyone knows what I'm doing. Yep. And so um, at the same time, it also makes it easier because I just 
share everything mm -hmm. and it makes it really um you know fun for me because i get to like learn new tactics and strategies and hear from people and then i just put it out there so mm -hmm. essentially what i've been doing on my own linkedin and podcast for the last four years i now get to do it and uh, get to work with like the best companies in the world who are our customers. Yeah, we really are spoiled, right? I mean, yeah, marketing to marketers is definitely an easier thing. Uh, I've, I give it uh, all the credit in the world for marketers that are marketing to cybersecurity and developers and engineers where they haven't done that role before because it makes it a lot harder. You know, you don't know, you got to rely on SMEs and the people internally of the company to make sure you get the messaging right and all sorts of things. But, you know, you mentioned something too, and before we move off mutiny on one thing that I just was interested about, a lot of people always talk about testing and they always want to test everything. So we work with a lot of different B2B SaaS companies from all the way to Series C. And so, you know, a lot of times the issues is like, there's just not enough data or traffic sometimes coming into the website to have any statistical significance. And so you may have a different perspective on this and I haven't read all the things about mutiny, but as personalization tools go, do you guys have like a point where you say, you know what, this isn't really a good fit because you guys either have the wrong motion or you don't have enough traffic hitting your website or what are kind of like the criteria for using website personalization, if any. Yeah. I mean, there are, um, there are traffic thresholds that allow you to have that statistical significance, uh -huh. but where personalization and AB testing differ is AB testing is like, you're just looking at one little piece mm -hmm. and one component and you want to have that statistical significance because you want to promote it because that thing is what's driving the results. Mm -hmm. Personalization, um, isn't, I mean, it does have the rigor um, and the stats to prove that this was a successful experiment and we should continue to move forward with it. But with personalization, it's more directional. Mm. Like you're doing things that directionally make sense to appeal to the segment that you're going after. Yep. And so, um, for example, if you want to, you know, you've got people coming to your homepage and you've got people who work in manufacturing and then you've got another audience segment of um, finance like people who work at banks or something like that. Those are two like drastically different um, customer personas, but you probably you serve both of them, right? right. If you have multiple um, ICPs. So just having different headlines and different images yeah. and a different like sub copy is going to have a drastic dif uh, is going to have a drastic result. Um, but you don't know which word, you know, is get led to the result, but you can test a bunch of different headers but you know that directionally, like this is appeal more appealing towards our manufacturing audience, and this one's more appealing towards our finance audience. Yeah. And so, like within Mutiny, you you can you do A B test, you know, different experiments against each other. But I think the power of personalization is is it's already like baked in that we're already moving in the right direction, and so you can take insights you learn from one experiment right. and apply it to a different persona and probably get similar results. Yeah, um, I love the and also like. The difference in impact yeah. is also pretty substantial. Like changing a button right. might have like a one or two percent uh, lift in conversion, and for an A/B tester, that's like awesome. That's sure. really like that's what you're looking for. But imagine changing the whole website copy. Imagine changing your whole homepage, right. and you get like a thirty percent increase in conversion right. based on smaller audience. Like it might be a small audience, but that's hugely impactful. Right. Because at the end of the day, I mean, to your point, I mean, you, everything can't be statistically significant because of the time it takes to get statistical significance and sometimes the budget from especially an advertising perspective. So to your point, like there's still just some directional things that just make sense, right? If I'm targeting CPG or manufacturing or whatever it is, right? And I'm sending them to a page to be able to personalize that page with related content and or messaging to them just makes sense. And even though you may not have a massive target account as you're going after pushing traffic to that page. It's still one of those things that ultimately is going to be like, okay, cool. When I get to this page, it's going to be more relevant to me. And so that's what it's all about. You want to make sure people ultimately resonate with whatever, whatever message is on the website, right? Absolutely. And there's pages where, you know, if you're trying to reach the statistical significance, you would want to run the test there. Like your homepage probably is getting the most traffic, Exactly. your product pages and all that. So like, depending on your you know, how many people are coming to your site in a given month, you can reach this statistical significance in a week yeah. or it might take a month. Like it, it, it kind of depends. Right. But to your point about like, if you're reaching out, if you're already on um, more targeted channels, like if you're doing like any account-based marketing or you're, you're reaching out to people one-to-one, -one, um, that's where personalization really has a deep impact exactly. because you're not, because you're already spending you know, it, chances are your your cost to get in front of them is already right. higher. Either you're doing it manually or you're really targeted on your ad platform. Yeah. 
Exactly. So sending them to a generic landing page makes no sense because you're already, you know who they are, you know what they want, exactly. you're going after them, and then you're sending them to a generic page that everyone else is going to see. Totally agree. Um, that's where personalization is super impactful when you can like call out their company name, put their logo there, mm -hmm. call out all the, the value props that are specific to that persona mm -hmm. and that industry, um, call out case studies, put social proof and logos that are relevant to them, not just, you know, Oh, cool. Right. Walmart uses us. It's like, yeah, but I'm not in that industry at right. all. Right. Um, That's a good point. That's a good point. Exactly. So you can really get nuanced and, um, and yeah, and that's what I think the, the difference there that uh, personalization offers. I love it. Yeah, I agree. Well, so, I mean, I guess kind of moving into kind of content strategy in general, I think everyone always defines this differently. I find content strategy, content marketing, there's content creators, there's SMEs, there's this and there's that. And, and all these lines that kind of get divided out into who really does what and how much does the head of content really own the content strategy or is that the CMO? And so I think there's all these things, but like, like, what's your take on? I mean, you're the head of content. I mean, what's like content strategy even mean? Like, what are the components that make up a content strategy or what is it? Because everyone yeah. loves to argue about this, I feel like on LinkedIn constantly, <laughs> which always drives me nuts, but I'm sure you have a take. I heard this recently. Um, Ryan, who is head of uh, head of marketing here at Mutiny, yeah. um, he kind of simplified it for me, which I really appreciated because I, I was getting in my own head. Same thing, like this is this is a relatively new role for me, and I was like, okay, what does strategy like? What do you what do you need from me? Like, what do you want to see? And I think, and so the the way I I that started to make sense to me is like strategy is your like unique point of view on what you're doing and why you're doing mm -hmm. it. Um, so in like in words, describe what your point of view is, why and why you think it's going to work. Um, so, you know, for example, of how we're running things at Muni, like I, I'd say our content strategy is we're giving the people who we want to get in front of and the people who are, you know, important for us to, to for them to know about Muni and be and be interested in Muni. We're only focusing on getting in front of them mm -hmm. and we're providing them all the information and the playbooks and the tools that they need to accomplish what they need to do at their company. Because right now, like marketing is in a really tough spot. Budgets are probably being cut. Mm -hmm. Your team might be downsized. Um, you're looking at these consolidation. Maybe people are look, taking a look at your tech stack and saying, I don't think we need all these tools. Let's cut this back. Mm -hmm. So everyone who we're selling to is already in like a defensive mode. But at the same time, they've also got big growth targets, like just because it's a weird part time in the economy that like, you know, money's tight, they still have expectations in terms of growth and revenue generation and pipeline. So the people we're going after are living this reality. And so what we can do and our point of view on the purpose of what content can do is to give them ideas, give them the direction and the way to accomplish that, mm -hmm. um, this relevant to their role and it is timely right now. and help them out for as long as it takes until they're finally like, actually, let me check out Mutiny and see what they do. And maybe they can help. Oh, and it's actually exactly what I'm looking for. Um, you know, if it makes sense, I'll buy it right now. And if not, you know, maybe not this role, maybe not this company, they'll know about us as they move on and uh, progress in their career. So that's sort of like, rather than getting really like, um, you know, granular with this strategy, I think point of view and directionally what you're trying to work on is is actually more important. And then you can worry about, you know, what chan what that looks like on every channel that you have the capacity to execute on. Yeah, I totally agree on point of view. I mean, I think it's a big one, right? Because it's so easy to create Me Too content. I mean, now with chat GPT and other things like that, I mean, you can pump out a bunch of just basic kind of Me Too content in a second. But ultimately, does that POV then align with the narrative of the company that they're trying to communicate to the market? And if so, then now you've got something that can stay consistent across it where people then can relate that point of view to your content. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of noise and you try and, I guess, bid on keywords to drive cheap traffic to your website. So I agree with you on that front. And then on your goals point, uh, too, which I thought was interesting because, I mean, everyone right now is crazy about revenue. Everything's got to be down to revenue, right? To your point, budgets are tight, capital's more expensive, interest rates are higher, inflation rates high. So we get a lot of different things that are going on macroeconomically, but also within the companies themselves. And so everyone right now was trying to figure out like, what works, what works, right? They're like, Stuart. Did that blog drive X amount of uh, deals for our, our uh, company or no? And so I think some of these things are become very hard, though. And I think especially when 
content uh, sits at a lot of times the top of the funnel where you're trying to uh, take people from aware to, or sorry, unaware to aware, et cetera, and move them down. And then obviously just provide value along the journey. Sometimes there's not this clear path where it's like, boom, I'm going to have this goal of this is the blog I'm going to create. And the reason I'm creating it is because I think it's going to create two deals because we did some back end math and we looked at the data and that's what it said we should do. And I think, while you know, you can run some of those things. It's just not that easy. We all know attribution is not perfect, but I guess for you, for goals, when you look at goals with content and mutiny, how do you break that down? Like what's, is the goal revenue? Is the goal other things? Or what's like, what's the core measure of success for content that you report up and you say, boom, this is working. Like we need to do more of this. Yeah. Yeah. I really don't think that, me- that if, if you're a content marketer and you're having to defend the ROI of every single blog Be post, <laughs> you're, yeah, you're at a company that probably, um, you know, that's just not cool. Yeah. I, uh, I would probably try and look for another <laughs> exactly. one. Um, yeah. So, but, but at the same time, I totally agree. Like you do need to have some type of line of sight to revenue, especially if it's not, yeah, that higher part of the funnel. So the way we do it is, um, every, we have, we have two, I guess we have three, um, I guess we have four, sorry, our team's growing. Uh, and so we have four sort of, um, sub sub pods within marketing. We have product marketing, Mm. we have, um, business development. So that's our outbound. We have growth, and so they own the website and ads, um, and then we have ecosystem. And within ecosystem, that is content, events, and community. Okay. And the reason why we're putting those all together is because we see them all as that top of funnel flywheel of getting people into your ecosystem, getting them into your universe, having them read your stuff, having them show up to your conference, Mm. having them go to a meetup that you're sponsoring, have them go to a webinar, like those are all fine. I'm great with that. Like that means that our content and event strategy is working because people are showing up. We can see the numbers going up. We know who those people are. Um, We know that they're relevant. We can see that they're qualified. And then um, what that means is we have like two numbers to measure there is one is, is that total number of people within our ecosystem growing? Because that means that we are you know, our message is spreading and that's our top of funnel um, owned audience. Owned audience is also especially important because we want to be able to get in, in touch with them, you know, down the line and not have to worry about, you know, LinkedIn or Google yanking the carpet from under our feet and all of a sudden like, we can't reach our audiences anymore. Exactly. Um, so one is like, you know, owned audience. Are we growing this database of people who know about mutiny and want to, you know, raise their hands a little bit and come to a webinar or read a thing mm-hmm. or go or join our community. Um, and then the second one, which is our line of sight to revenue, is who are within that people group of people who are kind of raising their hands, who are raising their hands even higher and are interested in now talking to sales mm. or talking and seeing a demo. Mm. Um, and so ecosystem has a, you know, num- a weekly goal of demos booked. Mm-hmm. Same way that paid has a weekly goal of demos booked, the same way that the BDRs have a weekly goal of demos booked. Mm. And so we all have an apples to apples comparison of all marketing programs mm. are contributing to pipeline because we're all booking meetings. And that's the, the metric that we're looking at as a team. Mm. And we can go and like, you know, if something's behind. We can go all work together to make that to, to bump it up and make, make up for that delta. Um, so that's how we're able to tie um, you know, pipeline to, is it worth sponsoring a happy hour at this conference? Because mm-hmm. we have the, the flow to move someone from an email address to a meeting book. How do you, to your, to your point, I like that. Um, how do you identify, I think you were saying that um, for the people that are raising their hand a little bit higher, I think is the way you put it. Uh, because you've got people that are engaged with the community. They're going to webinars. They're pretty engaged, I guess, generally with the content. Is it, is it just kind of as a lead scoring methodology? Or are you guys doing something else in the back end that's saying like, you know what, actually, I think these are actually good to take because they're on the pricing page or the case study page or this, that, or the other thing. I think we should maybe give them a reach out, you know, and prioritize that for sales because they've been with us for X amount of months, engaging with our content consistently. Like, what does that look like on the back end? Like, how do you figure out when to reach out? We, um, marketing owns most of the, well, I mean, BDR lives within marketing, but, um, they're kind of going after like net new Mm -hmm. account or net new contacts and net new accounts. But if you're like already in our ecosystem, meaning you've raised your hand and gone to one of our things, um, we, 
we just try and keep you engaged. Like we can, we have, you know, we can see, you know, repeat visitors. We can see like power users of people within our community who are engaging a lot, who aren't customers yet. So we can have, we can build one-to-one relationships and say like, Hey, what's going on? Like, sure. do you want to come host a thing with us? Like we build relation, we build genuine relationships. Um, because we're not really concerned with pushing them onto sales because like they already are here doing stuff with us. So they know about our brand and they, if it's right, if the timing's right and they're ready for us, like they would do it. Um, but one way that we, one tactical way that we do, um, you know, actively create these opportunities for people to engage deeper is, um, you know, using our own products. So if we can see behaviorally, someone's come to our website a bunch of times, we can start changing the the CTAs and we can change the headline copy and we can create these experiences saying, Hey, you've come back a couple of times. Like, um, you know, if you're, if you're still not interested in a call, check out this like recorded demo. Mm-hmm. And so we can start doing these lighter touch CTAs right. in front of people that are, you know, equivalent to a meeting books, but we can do it in a way that like they're actually interested in doing. Like not everyone wants to sit on a sales call because they don't know what to expect. Right. But if we can like, you know, gently say, like present them information and answer questions they have and like get rid of all the um, issues that they have in their head about why they're not on a sales call, then we have we have proof in our in our um, recordings of sales calls when they get on a call for the first time. They're like, oh, yeah, I've been on the newsletter for six months. I've gone to a exactly. bunch of webinars. I've hung out in the community. I know everything about your product. Now I'm ready to have a conversation about implementation. So, um, and you can see that qualitatively by going into Gong and typing in content, typing in newsletter, typing in community, yep. typing in event, and seeing how many times it comes up in calls with prospects, and then you know listening to that segment. And so it, 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 it's how people get to know us. And then when they move to the sales process, they're already fans. Yeah. I think to your point, I mean, that that's, I think, the the issues with a lot of different companies is that they're treating still webinar registrations and content downloads and other things like that is these are ready to go to sales. And, and I, you know, I was a salesperson at one, one of those companies that, you know, ran that type of operation. And I mean, 90% of them didn't want to hear from me and they got frustrated. Like, why the hell are you reaching out? Because we were like outbounding and cold calling and doing all sorts of things. But I think or really to your point, and I, what I see really successful is whether you have a podcast or you do an event or a webinar or whatever it is to get your customers to be part of the content itself. And so then whether, and even if they're not customers, even prospects to get the, to get them to be part of the, the content itself, because then you can start to your point, forming relationships and naturally just things seem to happen after that. Right. Or, you know, maybe there's still some strategic outreach from the sales reps, et cetera. But the key is that you've got to understand what intent looks like when people are engaging with these types of things. And pe- people like engaging with the community isn't a sign that, yeah, I want to talk to sales, man. Like, let's go. Let's, uh, let's have a demo, a conversation about mutiny. No one, no one really wants a, a demo or a, a conversation about mutiny. They may not even know what it is. Maybe they just got involved and they read a cool piece of content that didn't really have a mm-hmm. dotted line back to mutiny. It was just kind of cool and interesting. Uh, and it solved a problem that they were looking for. And so on and so forth. And so they engage later. And so I think it's about just keeping that relationship going and making sure we understand that hey, these are the types of people we should be passing to sales and when we should be passing to them. And the easiest way is obviously them reaching out, but we know that not every company is going to come inbound. So that's why you still need to have some outreach of going to them. But I love the approach, and I wish more companies would do it, of bringing prospects and customers in to calls themselves on a webinar or a podcast or whatever it may be, or an event, like you said, a happy hour, have them hosted together because then, you know, it's just more natural. It doesn't feel so pressured. And another thing on that idea of like using, like while someone's in your ecosystem, yeah. take advantage of that thing, of that trust that they're, they're putting in your hands. Exactly. Like they want, to, they see you as a resource or a beacon of something I can learn. And so they, that's why they joined. Um, and so use that as like a stepping point towards like, okay, how can I deepen this relationship? Um, one way we did that was we saw a lot of people in the community um, or like someone brought up like, oh, I'm redesigning my website. It's absolute headache. Oh my God, does anyone have any tips on like how they can, you know, make sure that this website redesign project ends up being a success and I don't like hate myself after it. And everyone's like, oh my God, ever, I've got a, I've got a horror story of my website redesign. And like everyone had a battle scar from like at some point having to be part yep. of a website redesign. Right. So what we did was we then, you know, Call, like brought it together all those insights um uh some people internally at mutiny like some of our customer experience people 
they've worked at agencies. They've worked with a lot of companies who have done website redesign. So they've been exposed to it a whole bunch. And we, within, you know, three weeks, whipped up another like, um, uh, workshop where we shared like, here's stuff you can do before, during, and after a website redesign that will, you know, get, give you the data to make sure that this is like a data informed redesign mm. and not just, uh, oh, this looks pretty, but doesn't convert. Right. Cause at the end of the day, we want this website to look pretty and convert and be amazing not just, um, you know, be a, a reskinning of it. And so, you know, we had like 250 people show up to hear about this website redesign and they were all in various stages of redesigning. Um, and so that was, you know, that's not really having to do with personalization, but you, there are ways you can, you know, use Mutiny, but also just like data sources that you can find within your website to use that his historical data about your website to inform what the future website should look like. Uh, and so yeah. that was a way of getting people in the room to chat about something that has nothing to do with our core offering, I love that. but like is still super valuable to everyone. I love that. You know, I honestly, I don't think I've met a marketer that loves their website ever. Everyone's always complaining about it. Oh no, it's uh, the messaging sucks or it needs to be redesigned or I don't know why they did this. And uh, don't worry, don't worry. We're redesigning it later this year. So I feel like honestly that topic hits well because it's also one of those things that, you know, Commonly, a lot of CMOs will do is they'll come in and say, first project I'm going to take on is redoing the website. And, um, you know, I'm not going to get an opinion there. but No, and and like sometimes it's just I want it to look this way and that's great. Exactly. And so what we laid out and the blog post is available on our website is you can go in and take historical data of like what pages are people even going to? um, How are they getting there? And you can like inform that design. Right. And, and present in data to the leadership if, if they need it and say like, look, I agree with you. Let's make it look this way. But I don't think we need to have all these things in the navigation bar because no one has clicked on that button right. in the last three weeks. Right. So exactly. let's just get rid of it. Exactly. It's so silly. That's funny. Yeah. yeah messaging and website always. I mean, I, there's always some need there. So pretty much you can reach out to any company in the world. They'll probably say, yeah, you know what? I would like to talk to you about that. That sounds interesting. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, I mean, so I guess like to break it down a little bit with Mutiny, I mean, let's imagine like, and I I don't know, because you haven't been to Mutiny like your entire life, right? Since the company started. But um, but what did the strategy look like, I guess, from the beginning? Because I think it'd be curious for people that maybe are earlier in the journey of creating a content strategy and putting something together that really works. Maybe right now they're just kind of doing a blog here or there. Maybe they've got an SEO agency and they're kind of doing this, that, but there's not really a unified structure to it yet. It's kind of just their own shit at the wall, mm-hmm. if you will. Like, so where do you start? And I don't know if you've gotten maybe some experiences from Mutiny where you can kind of lean on that, where you had some challenges and things you guys just messed up in the beginning on, or maybe that you did really well that you thought would really work. Like, what are some of those? Any stories there that you can share on the beginning side of it? Yeah, Um when I was interviewing at Mutiny um, over just over a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. the thing that kind of sold me was that I wasn't starting from absolute zero, but there was these temp or like formats that I could see were like really strong already and just needed to be like continued on. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I would say for anyone who's like really early on in the in the content thing and you're trying to kind of do a little bit of everything, what I would say is create like a format that is super repeatable and that is really um, focused on like one thing that your audience will find valuable and then find a way to like refine it. So, um, you know, it might just start off as you when like writing a blog post and you're like, okay, that took a long time. How can I speed this up? Okay. What if I had like a webinar that kind of gathered the information necessary for me to then put it into this format Mm -hmm. and then you can kind of like you know extend that content backwards to like okay what source material do i need to generate Mm -hmm. at a repeatable fashion that can then be very quickly turned into this format that we've we've agreed on and looks good and works and then like what are the things you can do afterwards to kind of um you know distribute it further Mm -hmm. i know this is like soup this is this is fairly basic like marketing where you need to have the pre-production of like, okay, what am I doing to like make the content? Then you've got the production of like, okay, what does the content even look like? And then you've got post-production. But what I'd say is like people kind of jump the gun and they're like, oh, I'm just going to like blog about everything. Mm -hmm. And every blog is going to be structured a little differently. You know, some of them are going to be very like informational. Others are going to be storytelling. Others are going to be roundups. Others are going to be like listicles. 
it's like that's too many decisions to make every time you need to put something out. Mm. And if you're trying to like get to the point of like, okay, we've got a cadence of like one thing a week, or maybe it starts with one thing a month and then it starts with one thing every two weeks and then it's one thing a week. Mm. You need to like, like it, it speeds up really quickly. And so what you need to do is find a format and systematize it like as quickly as possible so that then you can like push that away and say, okay, that is now an hour a week. I need to focus on that one format, knowing that it's going to go out. And I can now put my time towards bigger swings and getting that next thing going. Mm. Um, I'll give you an example of what that looked like at Mutiny and why I, I was really excited to join. Um, they had this format uh, that were called conversion playbooks. Mm. And the way it's laid out is at the top, it's, and these are, these are blog posts, uh, they're written blog posts, but the headers and the sections are what you want to focus on here. You want to find repeatable headers and sections that you can repeat endlessly. So it starts with what you'll learn, then it's like what you'll need. So we're kind of giving like a checklist of like, okay, as you're reading this, like, do you have the tools? Do you know what you're supposed to be getting out of this? Mm -hmm. And then it would go through and interview a marketer and they would share like one play or like one thing that they do mm. that leads to a conversion increase. And so they mm. share what problem they had going in. What was their thesis of like, if I tweak this, mm. it might lead to this result. How did they then do it? And then at the end, it shared the impact. Mm. And that was it. So it was like five sections that we can like apply to every single like technique that right. someone might have. Um, and they're really like actionable. They're, they're easy to read. They're quick reads. Um, you know, they're tactical. There's a few things in there that you can actually like apply right away. Right. Um, and so when I joined, like they had, I think they had like 10 or 12 of them that they, that they had like, um, just done all together as a blitz. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, this format looks really good. It reads really well. I've never seen it done in this format. This can be like a repeatable thing that we can do all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my first six months I was trying to get my feet wet, trying to get, get something going. So I would kind of do these manually. Um, and I would go find a marketer and like try to interview them similar style to this where I'm mm -hmm. like, can you like spare 20 minutes and we'll chat and I'll try and get this information out of your head and then I'll write it myself mm -hmm. and then I'll share you the draft and then I'll publish it. And it was like, okay, cool. Version one, a lot of manual work still. Like that's still quite a bit of work, but you know, we were able to keep, keep the cadence going a little bit. Then we thought, what if we actually, you know, source the marketers who are doing these from our own audio, from our own customers, instead of having to like find people who did cool stuff, mm. we already know our customers are doing cool stuff because we can see the back end product of like who's, who's launching stuff that is yep. increasing conversion. So now we're able to identify, talk to our customer experience team, find people who have cool stories and want to share them. Cool. Now we have like a backlog of people we can reach out to. How can we speed up that interview process mm. so that we can like more of these recorded so that I have more um, source material to give to a writer to make these, to, to get these done. So we created that into a webinar format that we now called Conversion Secrets Live, where we bring on three marketers. Each of them have 15 minutes and they follow that exact formula where it's like, tell me what problem was, tell me about the right. hypothesis, share how you did it, what were the results? They're presenting now. We can now generate like, excitement by having this conversion secret live workshop that goes live every month now so we can generate three pieces of source material every month predictably kind of forever mm -hmm. and now i can feed that recording directly to a writer who can then turn it into that format mm -hmm. um and so that's like now i have three of those a month without having to do a whole lot of like now the now the coordination comes in where it's like now i'm just worried about filling a pipeline of future webinars right Great. Now I've got like the pre-production and the production done. Now I've got like a constant inflow of these new playbooks that I can then share on social and use in our newsletter. Mm -hmm. So now I've got, you know, the whole, the whole process is like now built out. I mean, this took, you know, this is, this has taken us like 18 months to get to this and point. And how big's the team again? And how, how big's the team? How many people are part of the process? Um, at first it was just like, I'm still the only content person. Uh -huh. Um, and I've got a couple of freelancers who now help me out on the writing. But for the first year, I essentially wrote everything. Wow, sick, man. Um, That's awesome. And then, and then Danny who, um, leads our events and community, um, she kind of manages getting people on board and, and helping out with the webinar. So two people plus, uh, you know, 10 hours a month of freelancer time. Right. We now have like three things every month going out that are, that everyone is really into. And it feeds our 
webinars or sorry, it feeds our newsletter um, that's read by like 35,000 people every week. It. it feeds our social. It feeds um, now it feeds our ads as well, because mm -hmm. now these are like a repeatable format. Then now our ads team has taken them over right. and is now like driving paid traffic to these because we know that and we have the data to prove this, that someone, if they read one of these playbooks within their buying journey are uh, it was either two or three times more likely to convert into a, a demo yeah. um, than someone who hadn't read one of these. So we're now like slotting them into all of our, you know, outbound automations and any any type of like paid growth tactics. We're like we're scattering these everywhere and creating these really cool workflows mm -hmm. or these really cool experiences of like it's your first time on the website. Let's try and get a playbook in front of you because we know that everyone loves these right. and they convert. I think the big thing that you mentioned too, and I love that the way you laid that all out, but, um, but I think the big thing is too, that a lot of people forget about as a distribution of that. And so a lot of times it's like, Hey, we did the webinar and we promoted it and we sent it out to our email newsletter and then we put it on our website, we gated it. And that was the end of that. And then it just kind of dies there in the website. And most people are not coming back to your website to hang out and watch all your webinars They're hanging out on social channels and other places. So, you know, what place is like, repurposing and distribution come into play? Because you kind of mentioned with like the playbooks and paid, but do you guys do a whole bunch of other things in terms of like repurposing clips and podcasts or other things like that or other conversations or events and all sorts of things, whether it be organically or paid, both, et cetera, on social? Like how does that come in play? Because I think that a lot of people can pull people into that long form content, especially when you've got a cold audience as a herd of mutiny. Not everyone really wants to get on and listen to an hour webinar, but there are lots of people that maybe don't know mutiny that are willing to give a few minutes of their time off of LinkedIn, Facebook, or whatever other channel where they're like, oh shit, this is actually kind of interesting. I want to, I want to actually watch the whole entire thing and then go into that. Yeah. How does that kind of play into like planning? Uh, do you think about that at the beginning? Is it that the end or, or how do you kind of put that all together? A little bit of both the, so now that we've got that sort of structure built, yeah. that's now cleared my time and my brain space to like worry about the more strategic side of this where it's like, okay, how can we squeeze this more? Mm. How can we, you know, what does a video look like? What does in-person conversion secrets live look like? Um, how can we bake this into an ABM, you know, in person, like we've got conferences season coming up. Like how can I engage people proactively, have them be a speaker at a side event that we're running? Do I hire a video crew? And now I've got the, the taping of it. And I can turn it into a playbook and then I can like, you know, present that to you as like mm -hmm. an act of goodwill. Like there's a whole bunch of things you can do. And so that's why I think um, I, uh, I was chatting with Andrew Davies, at, uh, who's a CMO of Paddle at, um, yeah. at a conference recently. And his presentation was like, it should be brand and demand and, you know, keep going down the list and uh, like and partnerships mm -hmm. and ABM and paid and website and events, like make it yes and for everything you do right. and figure out how you can add that next layer of like, yes, let's keep going. What else can we do right. to make this like super valuable for like all your, all your programs, all your channels. And, um, but that doesn't, that's, that is only possible once you have a single format that works. If you were to start saying, okay, let's record, let's, let's get a bunch of people in a room and let's record it. And then we'll have like, you know, three hours of footage and then we'll turn to blog posts. Oh shit. Like, you know, the guests weren't that insightful. It wasn't actually that, it doesn't look that good on camera. Okay. These blog posts aren't that great. Okay. Yeah. Now we don't really have any good sound bites for video. Yeah. Okay. Like this, this we're kind of pulling at straws mm -hmm. for what the LinkedIn post can be. Yeah. The newsletter didn't read that great because, because it's, it was dependent on like that person at the event. Right. So it's like, you're trying to remove as many of the things that will catch you and up, you're saying make, trip you up. Yeah, and you're saying make sure it plugs into the format itself, which was playbooks for you. And if it can't plug into that format well, which already performs well, then it's probably not worth doing. It just leaves too much variables. Yeah. Like it, you want it to be like, okay, we know that someone needs to describe their problem. Yeah. So let's, let's, how do we capture that problem? You know what I mean? hundred yeah, um, percent. That's the thing I would suggest because once you have that format, you can then work backwards and forwards to say, okay, how can we make this cleaner, easier, mm. multiple formats? Let's add video, let's add audio, let's add ads, let's add social clips. Like you can add more, but you need to have one piece of like core content mm. that lives on your website that is owned, that sits there 
and then you can kind of build in both directions. And once you do that, you can then add another, let's call it a show, because like that's sort of what these are. Like Netflix didn't does like they don't think about their whole library as like what's going out in what days. Like they're 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 not thinking at that like tactical level of like how are we going to promote this on social today. Mm-hmm. They're thinking about it as like okay, we've got one show and all the associated pre work during work and post work that comes with that mm-hmm. great then let's layer on another show and let's layer on another show and before you know it they've got like a right. whole bunch of things that they know makes up the bigger strategy of like well we need to have seasonality to it we know that people like this genre yep. do we have are we hitting the right audiences so they can look at it from a high level and then they can zoom in on each of those shows and figure out what work they need to do to make that happen um i think B2B companies, that's sort of how you build that media brand is like you start with one and this is what we're trying to do at Muni. Right. It's like you start with one. We, we've now proven it out. Now I can go and create a new format that appeals to a different ICP, a different persona, a different, maybe a different product line down in the future or something. And I can then follow the same idea of like, let's get the format right. Let's get the concept right. Let's get the, the sourcing of that material right. And then we can build you know, everything else after that. Right. Love it, man. Super good thoughts. Well, let's wrap up on one thing. Um, have to have to address it because everyone's talking about it constantly. But what's your take on chat GPT, generative AI, Jasper, any of these tools that allow us to create content scales? Is this part of what you guys are doing in Mutiny? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Is it not there yet? Do you have, are you optimistic about it taking over? Our SEO agency's gone. I mean, where's your head with all this? I had a, a very existential weekend. <laughs> let's put it let's put it that yeah. way. About um about a month ago, mm-hmm. where all of a sudden it kind of like I think this was when Chat um, GPT four came uh-huh. out. Um, because like I had been exposed to Chat GPT three or just GPT three um because we used it we use it in our Muni product. Um, it allows it helps you to write copy it within the product. Cool. So, you know, I'd been exposed to it and I was like, oh, this is cool. Um, but I'd never been really impressed with like the use case for me. I wanted to write something long form. It's like, okay, depends on how well you can prompt it. And most of the results I was getting were not great. Mm. That was both the user error and, you know, the program error. Cause like I wasn't prompting it well, cause this was a new skill set that I did not know yet. Right. And, you know, three wasn't that great. Then all of a sudden four came out and all, and with that became, a lot of new information about how to prompt these and how to actually work with AI. So the combo of those two things of seeing the results and also having aha moments of like, oh, that's how I interact with with an AI. Really, that's what put me down that like rabbit hole of like, okay, I need to figure out how to work this. What does my role look like six, 12, 18 months from now? Because if all of a sudden content can just happen in a snap of a finger that looks exactly like the way I want it and says the things I want and and, you know, has all the things that my role was responsible for, like all the pre-work. Mm-hmm. What is my job now? What, what, what's my role? Um, how do I actually use this to like deliver on the results? Um, and so the, the direction I'm going with is I, it's not yet at the point, like we use it, I use it, you know, I think I use it daily at this point where I'm just trying to figure out ways of using it. None of our long form content is written with, with, with AI just because we haven't been able to get the result. We haven't been able to get the outputs that are better than our human outputs. Um, but we definitely use it for, you know, small stuff where it's like, let's generate 10 headlines and then we can use those as kicking off points. Let's help start writing metadata. Let's, um, let, you know, let's figure out these little things that take up time um, and build them into our workflow. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, on, there's tons of new stuff that's coming out. Like I, I started using one where you can literally upload a video recording and it'll automatically um, add the TikTok style uh, words below it. Huh. And so what is like, that? Okay, is that like a, another crazy. app or platform or something like that? Yeah, I think it's called Opal, Opal? or Opus. I'll Opus. Write it down. I've got this and, long um, list of AI tools that I uh, am constantly looking at too, but yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it, so, so to, to answer your question, um, I absolutely think that it's um, everyone needs to learn this of how to interact with them. I'd say that's like the bare minimum of like, don't be afraid of it, but you don't need to be so quick to like put it into your workflow, but learn how to interact with it Mm. and see what its capabilities are and try and push your own like understanding of like, okay, what, what could I use this for? Um, 
And then the role that I think all content sort of people are going to become is like, are, am I, or the, the ways that we can build a little bit of defensibility when everything is, you know, being able to be created in the snap of a finger is like, am I capturing interesting source material that I can feed into this AI that, you know, already knows my writing style and what our audience cares about? And is it able to pull new insights from that source material that have never been said before? Because as everything becomes me too content, it's like the insights and how you explain them that are really going to be the differentiators, not the volume in which you're able to like target keywords, I think, because all of a sudden that information now needs to be contextual to the person who's looking for it. So, um, you know, long winded, I don't know what the world, what the world's going to look like six months from now, but I would say that like figuring out how, at least in the, in the day to day to, to create workflows that use AI and try stuff in a new way. The second one is like, capturing source material like videos like this that you can then use a try and feed into ai and see what happens there um and then the third one is just to like really start refining your taste and like that sharp point of view of like here's what good looks like and here is what i don't want to be doing mm -hmm. and being very unapologetic about like this is the style and i will either create it myself or i'll train an ai to follow this style because this is the style that I want to be known for because you know, you don't want to be generic. That's, that's sort of the killer is like, you don't want to be great. You want to be the only, right. and that's the way you kind of stand out. I agree. I, I think people are underestimating it. I mean, I think most people are out there just uh, kind of waving it off. A lot of people that feel threatened by it, like, oh, my job's in jeopardy and whatnot. But I think you even said this on LinkedIn and I agree with it, that it's kind of moving from, you know, pure curator or a creator to curator. And so I think that to your point, once prompts get better, there'll be all sorts of things where there's prompts that are already done for you uh, that you can access and then create all sorts of stuff. But it's not, it's about like right now, at least where the technology is, is getting, you know, say 50, 60% of the way there and then being able to take it home with your specific point of view on whatever that specific piece is. I think where it still lacks though, that you'll, at least for right now, unless you're feeding it in the data, which I think that's the next step of what people are already starting to do is unique insights, proprietary insights from the product. And I think that's what you're relating to. And I completely agree when you think of like things like Gong and other tools where you're taking insights directly from the product, from thousands of different people and saying like, boom, we did the analysis. Here's the end. Here's exactly what things look like. And there's a lot more credibility behind those types of things versus just like, what's an interesting lead gen demand gen, right? I mean, we've done that 1,000 times ever. There's probably 100 blog posts and everyone's got a different, slightly different definition for it. And so ChatGPT could write that 1,000 times over in a heartbeat, but what it's still not good at is creating unique insights from scratch. That's not happening, right? Because it's just pulling from data in the past. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when it could pull those insights in from products, like that's the stuff that people want to hear. Like, hey, what was the case study? I mean, I think you mentioned maybe this was in your playbooks or you mentioned in some example there where, you guys had uh, like a conversion rate test or something like that related to setting up personalization of the website. And like those things are really interesting. You know, people want to know like, hey, what did you do and what worked and what were the exact numbers and how did you do it? And I think those yeah. things are tougher to get from, you know, those types of technologies, whether it's chat to UBT or other, right? Because now everyone's baking it into all their products. But we use it actually internally for, um, you know, writing even text ads for Google. So we've created, you know, you can integrate GPT into your Google Sheets and create all sorts of customized prompts. So you can just grab product marketing descriptions and all sorts of stuff to at least get close. I mean, some are shitty and you got to like say, ah, this isn't really good enough, right? And you got to come over top on it, but it saves still an immense amount of time and uh, it's still pretty good and it's only going to get better. So I think um, to not be using it is, would be a huge mistake uh, and just kind of leaning into it and saying, hey, great, it's going to make me more efficient and then I can f figure out the stuff that's actually going to just make it better or potentially do other ad formats that, or other uh, content formats that might be uh, might be better for a different ICP, like you said before. Yeah, totally. So. And even if you if you have no interest in like using it on the productivity side, like trying to do things faster, then I'd say use it on the on the like discovery yeah, side, idea like, side, hundred um, percent. Helping yourself to think differently and see your blind spots. If nothing else, like one prompt that I really thought was interesting was you say you write a blog post and then you paste it in and then you ask it. If someone was reading this, where are some areas that, you know, the, that I contradicted myself or where are some areas that I could expand on this further for a beginner or where are some advanced, like which parts of this were too advanced 
or not advanced enough. And then you can like ask it to like pull out yeah. exact quotes and stuff like that. And so then you can use it as sort of like your jumping off point for other things you're going to write. Exactly. Like then you, ha- there you go. Now you've got like, you can go write the beginner version of that same blog post and the advanced version of that same blog post and distribute it to those audiences exactly. in different ways. And now you've sort of like had AI help you to do the, like the thinking stuff that might take a lot of time or effort 100%. or you're just not good at. Um, and so that's sort of the other, just the other side of it. Instead of just, just having it do work for you, you can actually make it think a lot clearer for you. As well. I agree. I agree. I think, uh, it's, it's definitely untapped and I mean, clearly, you know, in probably four months time, everyone will have a baked into your product in some way, some shape or form. So it's going to be wild. Uh, be wild. I mean, we did a, we did a hackathon, um, a company wide hackathon uh-huh. where, you know, it was a Friday afternoon and everyone had three hours put into their calendars. We broke off into teams yeah. and everyone went and tried to solve a problem that we either have internally or that our customers have. And then we all came back and did a show and tell. That's cool. And I think already three or four of those ideas that were presented in a three hour time span were, are already implemented in product and are live. I love that. The speed in which everything happens now is just crazy. Um, but it's exciting. And I think it's a really unique time for content, both because, you know, there's so many formats that people are paying attention to right now. I mean, like short form video is crazy. Mm-hmm. Even just like normal, even just text on LinkedIn, like the, all these things are still like there's a lot of energy behind it. There's a lot of creativity behind it. Um, and combining those two along with the disruption that's happening. Oh, yeah. I think it's just like the very unique time um, and a very exciting time. Oh, yeah. So, You've uh, got like, I mean, I use Grammarly and now Grammarly's got it baked in as well. And so when I'm typing out LinkedIn comments, it's like, would you like me to rephrase that? Or would you like me to finish that? And, you know, of course, everyone's now giving a lot of shit for comments from those. But, um, you know, I think, again, it's uh, getting some ideas out on paper and writing something a little bit more substantial than just like, I agree, or that sounds great or whatever, or, like add something to the conversation. And, you know, maybe some people are better at that than others. And so if you can use something that gives you just a little bit of an idea and then you can build off of that and write something that's yours, then I think uh, that's huge. So. Well, good chat, my friend. Anything we missed that you think we should uh, mention before we jump off? Or did we kind of hit at least some of the high levels? I mean, clearly we didn't, uh, we're not going to discuss everything content marketing in a 45 minute <laughs> session. That'd be impossible. But anything you think we should mention before we jump off? No, I, uh, I think we covered uh, all, the, all the things that are really top of mind for me right now. Um, yeah. But yeah, definitely um, reach out to me on LinkedIn is the best spot. Uh, you can find me there cool. and, and see a lot of the stuff that I'm putting out. Um, and yeah, if you want to check out Mutiny, it's mutinyhq.com and, uh, you can see, you can load your website up and try, give it a whirl and try personalizing your site. You, without taking a demo, you can do it right there. Yep. We'll put the link in the comments for sure, man. But, uh, yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. Well, I'm going to jump and we'll see you on uh, LinkedIn and all sorts of other places, but I uh, enjoyed having you on my friend. Yeah. Thanks Jonathan. Right, Cheers, Cheers. Man. All right. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of the demand podcast. Again, I'm Jonathan Bland, the co-founder of OmniLab. I'll also have with me Jason Steele, who's the other co-founder of OmniLab on this podcast as well. Uh, we're a demand gen agency for C to Series B SaaS startups. Um, if you like this episode uh, or you're looking for some help with demand gen, please feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn over a DM, or you can go just directly to our website. That's OmniLabConsulting.com. Otherwise, uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode where we'll be talking about all things Dimension. Until then, thanks. Bye-bye.